Um, I'm honored to be with such an amazing group this morning or this afternoon, uh, attending the Southwest, uh, South by Southwest Conference. It's a small, hearty group, so if you want to move up closer, please do. Uh, I know I'm competing with lunch and other great sessions, so thank you for uh, those in the audience for being here. What I'm enjoying about this conference is the opportunity to have some provocative conversations uh, and learn more about the new trends and challenges in technology. But I have to tell you, I'm not going to be talking about bells and whistles and the latest new um, technology tool. Uh, not that I, uh, well, I probably can't talk about it. I shouldn't say I could. I probably can't talk about it. But I think it's important that we have conversations that really engage people in a different way because technology, is, as, as I've seen it, is, a, is an extraordinary tool to connect individuals together. But what does that conversation look like when we are together is what I'm going to talk about today. So my talk, Our Latino Students, Voices Calling Us to a Brighter Future, I will share with you my personal and professional experiences that we hope will inform policymakers that are here, educators, business leaders, about the importance that culture plays in learning and teaching, and especially those in leadership positions or business entrepreneurship. How important culture plays in whatever product you're developing, whatever relationship you're going to have, and more important, how we really raise the standards for all students. Everyone in, invested in education and our children should have in their sphere of influence really should reflect the perspectives, faces, and languages of all stakeholders with an emphasis on the fastest growing population in our nation, Latino children and their families. So let's begin with where we are and who we are. Here is some data. In 2000, we were 35.2 million. In 2010, we're close to, over, close to 52 million. And the expectation by 2020 is to be over 63 million in the population. We have grown over 48% in the last 11 years as a population. We are the youngest ethnic group in the United States with a medium age of being 27. The percentage of Latino students in our nation's public schools has nearly doubled, representing over 20% of the student enrollment. And it counts for 60% of the total growth in public schools. There are currently over 13 million Latino students in our K-12 public schools. One out of five is a Latino child. And kindergartners entering our public schools, one out of every four is a Latino child. And we compose close to 22% of the total labor force in our country. In the coming decades, Latinos will be the growth of the labor force and will account for 60% of the nation's population growth in the next 20 to 30 years. So as you can see by this growth and this demonstration of the number and the population that we have, it requires Latinos to be at the forefront of all educational, health, and employment initiatives. The Pew Hispanic Center in August reported there was a 24% growth in Latinos in college enrollment from 2009 to 2010. The number of 18 to 24 year olds attending college was an all time high in 2010 of over 12 million students. And that surge of growth of 24%, we now make up the largest minority in the nation's college campuses. This is spurred by population growth, but also the aspirations that our Latino families have and our Latino students. And just to give you an example, in 1972, when I graduated from college, there were only 13% in college at that time. In, 27, in 2009, there were 27%, and in 2010, 32%. But that's only enrollment. The struggle is about completion. How many Latinos actually complete college and have a a bachelor's degree or higher. So I'm going to share some dismal statistics with you. For all populations, close to 30% have a BA or higher. For African Americans, it's almost 20% of the population, of the, of the population subgroup. For Latinos, we're not even at 14%. So enrollment means one thing, com college completion means another. So there is a lot of work to do. Now for high school dropouts for Latinos, we're also the largest number. We're over 
35% of the college of the high school dropouts in our in our communities. And we also the lowest high school graduates over close to 27% when others are higher. So to achieve the equity and justice in the conversation that I'm going to have with you today, Latinos must be at the table, but how are we going to be at that table? We're, we're not even at the point where people respect who we are, have us college completion, have the degrees and the necessary paperwork to be at the table. So wherever important decisions are made, if there are Latinos at the table or other groups of minorities and people of color, who at the table is going to give that voice to us? Who's going to represent us at the table where important decisions are being made every day in our lives? So it's important that Latinos succeed and aspire and complete a college degree. Education and the education of Latinos is truly imperative for our success of our nation. Nothing can hurt us more than to have a large population of our citizens uneducated. So it's a responsibility for all of us here to begin to have those conversations of how to make it happen. So data is one starting point. And a colleague of mine at USC wrote a great article. And I know many of you may be educators here. And we talk about data-driven decision making. We've heard that often. She has a different take on it. She says, data does not drive. What it must do is spur us to action. So having information alone doesn't necessarily mean that changes will occur. So I want to talk a little bit about Oops. Know what happened here? Where I grew up. Because I want to put in context my 40 years of experience in public education, but as a professor and my own experience as a child living and growing up in East Los Angeles. I've seen gains and I've been very proud of as chosen uh, education as a profession. More important because it's a profession that I think and we were talking at dinner last night with a couple of colleagues. In my opinion, it's one of the few professions that really can impact an entire community by the leadership at the schools, by the leadership in the school district of making connections for underserved students. It's a profession that I felt by engaging community members, by engaging students, I saw many students succeed who otherwise wouldn't have. But it also is engaging our students in democratic principles with the hope to achieve equity and justice. As time has passed, though, I've reflected on the changes and still what remains the same. And I see evidence that still a lot needs to get done. That's demonstrated my fact, as Christine talked a little bit about my career. I was either the first woman or first person of color to be in a position of authority. And too many times, I was both. And too often, that is still the case for Latinos. It's not that we don't have Latinos who are qualified. But often it was, a, it was a feeling that the community of Latinos was temporary, that we really weren't going to be here long. I'm third generation on my mother's side, and I'm fourth generation on my, grand, on my father's side. So we've been here a long time. So I often talk about, you know, where do we talk about going back when back is where I've been all the time that's now the United States. It's I'm back. I'm there. So what I learned over time in reflecting is that organizational policies do not often really find ways to recruit us or to assist us. It was either sink or swim. And if you had it in you, you know that saying, you know, pull yourself by the bootstraps, you'll make it. And sometimes we were called upon, as I was as a young um, assistant and working in schools and playgrounds and different things, I was often called to sit at the table to talk to a community member or to speak to a community member in Spanish or to teach in a bilingual classroom. But they were really surprised when I had expertise in other areas, like, ah, you know that? Yeah, I do. I have other skills. I'm just not bilingual. So why do I share this context? Because as Latinos, we're not here temporarily. We're here for the long haul. We've been here, and we're going to stay here. And as our Latino population continues to grow, we still have that negative uh, negativity toward immigrants, and people of color continue to be blasted over the radio, blogs, and tweets, the negative comments, but we're missing the point how important Latinos will play to the success of our country because we are a large portion of the labor force. And our public education is the vehicle to make this happen. 
It is undeniable that the success of our nation is inextricably tied to the success of the Latino community. There's a quote that we use in our book and, and in other um, speeches, and Thurgood Marshall said it best, and I'll paraphrase it. The improvement of opportunities for those least well served in our society results in all votes rising. So let me take a, provide a personal narrative of what I believe needs to take place in school. So my background, I grew up in East LA, and uh, this is a little later picture, Rudy Boulevard, and for those of you that are my generation, and the East LA at that time when I was growing up was very popular, Whittier, you know, cruising down Whittier Boulevard, and it was a lot of fun. But I grew up in a single parent home. Uh, my mother, for economic reasons and for all the right reasons, we moved around to but uh, in the different communities, and I went to seven schools by the time I was in fourth grade. So I was one of the children that you might see that's considered at risk. You know, how are they going to make it? They're not, there's not stability. There's a single parent home. And growing up in the 50s, that wasn't a common occurrence as a single mother. My mother raised us. But she was loving and nurturing and inspired us. And we lived in communities that were so diverse. I grew up with Japanese Americans, Jewish families, Russian families that spoke Spanish. I grew up with Jewish families. I grew up with uh, Italian. Chinese, even mixed races back then in the 50s and 60s was, was caught, um, unheard of. And the diverse groups, and I also grew up in, in gangs. Where I grew up was Little Valley that fought with Barrio Nuevo, was this kind of, so I knew the guys and gals who were in the gangs as well, and I knew you know, the families who were um, kind of middle class. It was a very diverse community. But over time, and I look back, I realize that I was very fortunate to live in such a diverse community. But I now know that the school system didn't take advantage of that. They didn't take the time to look as diversity as a strength. We didn't spend time learning about the uniqueness of our culture, our identity. We were to be homogenized, that famous melting pot, as if colors could just wash away. We had to forego our identities, our home language, and often lose our cultural heritage. As a teacher and administrator, over time, I began to see how the system struggled to give voice to families that looked like me, talked like me, or had other issues that were different from the dominant culture. We also, as a system, didn't do a good job with students who struggled with the English language. Again, we were not willing to learn the uniqueness of cultures represented in our schools. And yes, our system in the school district that I worked we had the requisite bilingual staff, we had the ESL classes, and we even had great bilingual programs. But when budgets got tight or politics were too hot for the system to handle, they were the first to go. Somehow, they'll figure it out. Over time as a young administrator, I was able to make changes at my school, but very little change in the system-wide supports for families. And I moved up the ranks, as indicated in the, in the brief overview of my career, to become superintendent of Montebello Unified School District. And even then, as a superintendent, I struggled with issues of inequity and lack of support for families. But in my second superintendency, I had a wonderful experience that I want to share with you. I had an opportunity to take a new position as superintendent of the Salt Lake City School District in Utah. I'm not Mormon. Uh, I went there as um, alone. I left my husband back in California. So walking into this culture, and if you're familiar with uh, the LDS culture and, and, and Utah, family's very important, and as it is in my culture, extremely important. But the fact that I moved there without my husband was just kind of startling. How could she do that? What's wrong with her? Uh, how, you know, what's wrong with her family? But I understood going in how important my role was going to be in accepting this new culture, particularly kids that I was going to serve that were not like me, had different experiences, but also I was going to learn a new culture. And so as I began to enter into this new culture and getting to know it and understanding it, working with a wonderful school board and wonderful community, I began to take this experience and transfer it over to the system. I began to have this conversation with broader communities. 
I shared with them some of the difficulties I had coming into a, a, a new culture. Being the only woman superintendent and only woman a person of color out of 40 superintendents. My first day walking into that meeting of superintendents meetings, and there was a group of men around a table. And they looked at me, for all of you can remember junior high and how odd that was, and you're walking in, and, and there's a boy and a girl, and they kind of look at you like they're checking you out like that. It's exactly the experience. I felt like I was back in eighth grade again. And understanding that I was this novel person, something new that they had not been accustomed to. First woman superintendent in Utah. First person of color that had a voice. So I understand that coming in, what that was meaning for me and what that was like for them. So I tried to have conversations about what it was like. I was very honest about what I was feeling. And it was understood by the community members that I was gonna learn about them. So sometimes they challenged me about, you know, how did I know about their culture, what, what they, their values were. And I had some tough conversations with people about, I know my school stuff. I'm an educator. 80% about what you're doing here is about 80% about what all schools do. Kids are kids. Nothing's much different. Parents are, we all want the best. And that I had to spend the 20% learning about the culture. And what I shared with them as I worked with individuals in Utah was that I, to be successful, I was spending 80% of my time on that 20% on the culture. So I used this experience with my board and my community and my staff and shared with them what is happening for our community. Because within 10 years, the increase of minority population in Utah grew to 40%. That's a tremendous shock to a system within 10 years. It wasn't slowly coming in, it was just like that. And so I talked to them about it. So what are we doing to embrace all these new cultures? What are we doing to have them understand our school systems, how we operate? What are we doing? And the system focused, as most systems do, on equal, not, equal, not equity. It was equal. Well, they have equal opportunities. They get to come and sit into our classrooms. They have the materials. But that's not what I was talking about said, how are we preparing our families and communities to really have access and really have meaningful engagement about what is going on in their schools? And so as we prepared, fortunately, we had the 2202 Olympics, Winter Olympics. It was fabulous. I got to participate in that. So, you know, five, six years when we were selected, we started uh, preparing. And I chuckled when I would hear the theme, we welcome the world. And so being in the capital city of Salt Lake City, you're the capital city, you're right by, you know, where things are happening, I would often say to legislators, the world is already here. In Salt Lake, I had over 90 different languages. I had over 15, 20 different cultures, unique cultures represented in our community. And they would look at me if I was talking about another place, yet it was right in the capital city. So I realized that even though my district was experiencing this statewide, it was still a foreign comp concept to them. So then I began to talk about equity at the heart of our decision making. Because if I didn't, it was a lost opportunity for the children that I was serving in Salt Lake City School District. So I did it not only by words, but by action. And I have to say I had great support from my Board of Education. I found myself being that bridge with other groups to mediate conversations about race and diversity. Those are difficult conversations to have because for the most part, you have to be transparent about the data. I would go to meetings and rotary meetings and all talking about the data, 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 about what was happening in our schools because if I wanted to enlist the support of all the policymakers and everyone in the community, they had to understand that our ultimate goal was to serve all children and specifically and particularly those that were least served by the system. But to do that, we had to build trusting relationships and we had to take risks. So I was the one to take risks because I was sharing my story. I was honest about my son walking down the street and they would go up to him and ask him, what tribe are you from? And he'd say, I'm not Native American. 
or you look like Se uh, uh, Junior Seah, because he thought he was Samoan. And I would share these stories and what people would say to me about, you know, but you don't look Mexican. Or the first time I've heard, because I'm pretty fair for, for a Latina, you know, we come in different wonderful colors. And the first time a parent said to me, well, she's dark like you, Dr. Robles. I said, hmm, I hadn't thought of myself dark. I guess I am next to you. So it was just those conversations that I said, okay, if I'm facing this and I'm in a position of authority, what are our kids and families facing? So I took risks in taking that conversation and moving it forward because it was important if I was going to truly be an advocate for equity and justice for our kids in our community because it was action based on equity. It talks about who gets what with limited resources. It's a way of having the work look different and still have the positive results for students. We also had to accelerate results for our most underserved students. It was about high expectations. It was about bridging alliances across differences. So in Salt Lake City, we began a journey of professional development, six years. I was there over eight years. So I was there for, for a while. And an interesting side note, they, everybody kept thinking that I was going to leave, that I wasn't going to be able to stay there, that I wasn't going to be able to, I don't know, take it or do what, I don't know what. So at one meeting, my board was uh, talking to him about it. They said, Dr. Robles, you know, the community thinks that you're not going to be here. And I said, why? I've already been here, you know, so many years. And so what I had to do to show them this, as I showed the, I had to show them all of the data, the superintendents around me, I was one of the longest serving superintendents. But because I was different, because I wasn't from that culture in their eyes, it was going to be perceived differently. So again, the conversation, what are we thinking about for our children and our families? They're only here temporarily. We don't have to invest in them. So don't worry about it. Let's put our money where we know the kids are going to go to Yale and, and BYU and Harvard and on those places. But let's not invest in the kids because they're not going to be here. They're transient. They're not going to be here. So it's those conversations that I was fortunate to have and learn on this six-year journey. Because it was not just serving the status quo, who are very well served by the dominant culture, but it was moving toward an equity agenda in my school district. During that time, I also was having conversations with two of my wonderful colleagues who are here, Dr. Ott and Dr. Franco, about writing a book about the superintendency because it still is very unfortunate there are very few Latina superintendents, very few. And that has to change as well. So we started talking about our conversations and we shared our personal journeys. And we realized that the barriers to our progress were not isolated successes, but were really deeply rooted in systemic forces. And we also knew that if we were gonna make it and do it for our families, that education had to be at the heart of it. So we discussed with two other colleagues whose work on cultural proficiency we were truly indebted to and worked with, Dr. Lindsay and Ms. Graham, we began to share our stories for Latinos, hoping that our stories would begin and be a useful tool in conversations about equity and justice. So we got very personal about equity, the quality of being fair and impartial, justice, fair. We talked about that and about our own lives. And we could tell that by telling our stories, we could learn, that we could learn from others. We realized that our stories and our lives were really about taking risks and bucking the system, and how we could, as leaders, really influence education and working with them. So we began our, to write our book. And what we learned is barriers to progress have not been isolated incidents, but deeply rooted systemic problems, and that we want to share this story because we want readers and others in education and other leadership positions to be informed and empowered about their journey to equity. So we learned some insightful thoughts and, and feelings about our work. We learned, and through our stories and talking about it, that we as leaders, we became leaders not in spite of our identities, but because we were women of color. That's a big shift. 
that was probably one of the most painful experiences to understand that because we had grown up in a system that had not valued who we were. But we got the job precisely because we were Latinas, because of what we could offer from our culture and our strength and what we brought to the table. As difficult as it was sometimes, and against the pressure to do so, to become su successful, we did not assimilate to, dom to the dominant culture of leadership. The other lesson is we didn't have to act like a man to be a successful superintendent, as too often that is what occurs. So in writing our book, we developed the cultural leadership, proficient leadership rubric. And that's where I'm gonna spend the next 15 and 20 minutes talking about a tool that we hope that you'll look at, we gave you a handout, that you'll look at and begin to see how, where are you on this continuum? So I'll share a few examples. So the rubric looks like this, and we didn't fill it all in because even in your handout, it's tiny, would have been very tiny on the screen. So we look at language and our standards of behavior to illustrate where I am on this continuum to ensure an equity agenda. Because we believe that schools truly are at the heart of this engagement to make a difference for kids. Because schools are the most viable social, cultural, and political institution to leverage changes for society that is truly democratic, just and just for all, not just a few, but for everyone. So we believe in our title of our book is that it begins in schools. So what is cultural proficiency? It's personal, very personal. It's a way of being. It's about being effective in cross-cultural situations. It's about educating all students to high levels through knowing, valuing, and using their cultural backgrounds, not asking them to step out of their skin to be successful. And then within the context of our teaching, it's about our leadership actions. And as individuals, we must recognize first our own assumptions, examine oneself first. And even if one travels through the journey, as many of you sure, I'm sure have, and I have as well, there's going to be progress and there's going to be barriers. And there's going to be resistance to this as I faced often in my career. So what's, what are the barriers? First, the status quo. The status quo is going to do everything it can to maintain the status quo. It's just part of science, it's just part of physics. It's going to do everything it can to find and keep in what their mind is balance. And another barrier is that individuals are really unaware of the need to adapt. We've always done it this way, but I don't have to do it. And also more isolating and more probably harmful is that some people really have a sense of entitlement. They, they earned it. They have it. They have the privilege. If you want it, go get it. I'm so sorry you don't have it, but I'm not going to change. So how do we begin to examine our core values? What are the tools and standards of behavior that will guide us moving from a deficit model to an asset model? For example, in our language, instead of using underperforming students, we change the language to underserving our students or under-resourced under communities versus poor, and poor communities. They're under-resourced. There was nothing poor in my community. Nobody was poor in values and character and language and culture and pride. We weren't poor, we didn't like that. They were under-resourced. So to view our worlds as what we believe in our journey, the journey I had in Salt Lake City and the journey I still continue to go on, is that we begin by looking at ourselves through an inside out approach. So we have to use a tool that'll help us engage in this conversation. Because as my colleagues and I know that when you're in a system as a leader, you don't just go and show up and start having this conversation and expect to survive your first contract. It's difficult. But having it, as I did, sharing my experience, being real honest about what I was facing, what I was dealing with, what my husband and my son were facing. So giving them an example and transferring that out, using the tool about an organization before they have the comfort level to look inside. 
So the tool provides us this rubric with a means to assess and change one's own values and behaviors and policies and practice in a way that serves our society. So what are the guiding principles of cultural proficiency? There are a few. First, culture is a predominant force in shaping values, behaviors, and institutions. And you cannot not be influenced by culture. It is there. It's like a fish in water. It's there. To deny it is having the fish land on the sand. It's, it, it is what it is. And people, as I said earlier, are served in varying degrees by the dominant culture. Some are served very well, and others are not. People have a group identity as well as an individual identity. So you can't make sweeping statements about all. And every group has unique culturally defined needs that must be respected. So for the group, respecting the group, more likely you're gonna respect the individual. If you respect the individual, because in your cultural lens, they're just a little different, that you, know, you don't look like you're Mexican, you don't talk like you're Mexican, you don't act like you're Mexican. So you're unique in that way, but you're not really Mexican because Mexicans over here do this. That's not cultural proficiency. That's harmful. Because to respect the individual, respect the group, and vice versa. So the leadership rubric provides five essential elements that you see down on the, on the, on the left-hand column that truly are standards for culturally competent values and behaviors. And then on top, it provides a continuum of practice that indicates the unique ways of perceiving and responding to differences. So I'm gonna share with you a little bit about the five essential elements, and you have a copy of the Managing Dynamics of, of uh, Diversity, and we're gonna have a little activity on that with that. So I'm going at the top, assessing culture, claiming the differences. So in our tool, and looking inside before looking outside, you would look at yourself as a leader and say, hmm, do I perceive cultures as assets and strengths, or do I perceive them as deficits? Do I look at, at the leader where I use personal experience from my own background to develop and maintain ex wonderful policies that will benefit underserved populations because I value those differences? Because it's often used, and this is kind of the more on the left hind of the top column, cultural blindness and, and, and beyond, is that most people will tolerate diversity if it doesn't get in the way of their goal. Because they have a very narrow definition of American culture. And they also believe that they are superior to others. They feel they're more entitled. When I arrived in Salt Lake City, the 27 schools, and there's just like in most communities, in Salt Lake it's not a very large city, but we had what was called the west side and the east side. The west side was more like the community that I grew up in, under-resourced. And the east side was more of a community that had every resource and everything that possible for kids' success. So I go to the west side and I walk into a school and I walk into the cafeteria and I've been visiting schools and I walk into the cafeteria and I see a classroom on the stage. I see a classroom in a small little cubby hole, kind of like a, a large custodial office. I see these rundown down trailers and then there was a, actually a classroom on, in the cafeteria floor so that they would have to leave before the cafeteria serve food. Now I had been to the other schools on the east side and I noticed that in those schools, they had rooms for an art class, a music class, a computer lab. So I asked the question, why are those classes in this school on a stage? And they looked at me like, well, that's sure an odd question. They don't have room. I know that. I know they don't have room, but why haven't we done something to help them get the space they need? And that conversation was one that I continue to have over time as we begin to talk about where the resources go. It isn't about equal. It's about equity, about fairness. So that is about assessing the cultural resources that we have. It seems that they say, well, nobody seemed to complain. Well, that's not, that's not, that's, we don't wait to hear a complaint if we see something wrong as a leader. We take action. The second element, valuing diversity. 
naming the difference. The leader is aware of values and learns and supports and promotes his or her culture and the culture of others to respect and value multiple and diverse opinions, cultural perspectives, experiences, and styles to inform decisions about the organization. It's not to celebrate Cinco de Mayo or one month a year we have African American Month or Women's Month, March. That's the year month we're on, so we're gonna celebrate women. You know, it's the only time we do it. Well, I'm here all the 11 other months, so I wanna be celebrated the whole time. So what does this look like in schools? It's assuming that we don't have to give our families the necessary information and background because they just don't get it. So in many of our schools, we receive federal funds and we have the perfunctory signature on a budget, but we don't spend time talking to the parents and communities about it because they just don't, they don't quite understand. They don't have the back, right background. It's not truly engaging families in a way that engages them in meaningful participation because we value them as an asset, not making assumptions about what they have and what they don't have. The third, managing the dynamics of diversity. Leaders solicit diverse points of views, opinions, learning communication, and leadership styles to promote flexibility in meeting organizational goals. And here, the leader, and the reason I selected this as, as one activity for you, is this is where you take risks. Because you're managing the conflict. You're managing and reframing the difference about cultural proficiency. And you know you're gonna take a risk, and you're gonna anticipate criticism, and you're gonna do it no matter what, because it's the right thing to do. For example, again, using my last example, I'm gonna share two. They had, as footballs at high schools, you know, rivalries are, they had a, a typical um, hazing, I won't, not hazing is too strong of a word, uh, tradition, I'll say, a tradition, of where one school would go right there initial on the grass of the other school. So if it's East High, West would go and write, you know, burn. When I got there, coming from my background, that's vandalism. Right? Vandalism, you know, that's a cost. So I went to the school and they said, oh, they're just pulling pranks. Who are those kids pulling pranks? I don't know who they are. Well, they were kids of privilege. Very, very well connected. And so I said, no. I said, because I know that if the kid had looked like the Samoan kid or the Latino kid or the other kid there, he'd be in juvenile hall. So those kids are going to be, they're going to, there are consequences. We are not going to treat them different. That's, that's vandalism, and there's a cost to this. The same thing occurred when I met with student leaders at the high school that had a great group of, great group of kids. So I think that's why I went when I met with the kids. They were fabulous. They understood that they were given little or no consequences for behaviors that others who didn't look like them or had privilege like them had dire consequences for. And they sat with me and said, well, you know, Dr. Robert, we don't think that's fair. We know, I mean, we don't want to get punished harder, but if you're going to do it, it should be equal. So I talked to the principal about it. He said, oh my gosh, you know, you know what that would mean? I, take that risk, I've got your back. Because if you don't, everybody knows it. And that's how we continue to that sense of entitlement that I get away with it. And it's something that managers and leaders and others and you know whatever middle, you have to take that risk if you're really going to work on behalf of all children. So they knew that, the students knew it, knew it and the leaders ignored it. And that was the way it was. You know, fortunately it changed over time, it wasn't easy, but it, but it did. The fourth element is adapting to diversity, change because of differences. Leader facilitates an understanding about the truth of the organization's effectiveness in achieving equitable outcomes. They take personal responsibility for achieving and building capacity to transform the organization's ability to achieve equity. So what this means is how transparent are you about what you're doing for your, for your group or your organization or your business? What is the data? What does the data show? So oftentimes, we look at data very surfacely. We say, okay, we've got, oh gosh, 20% of our kids are actually um, 
making it, and the others, well, they could if they wanted to. But really looking at data to inform how decisions are being made about who gets into courses, how course patterns are being taken. And it look, looks at data about students and not masking it and really being honest about it. When I went to Rotary Clubs, it was a very influential Rotary Club. Again, it was the capital city, so you can imagine the power players that were there. And I showed the data. And the University of Utah president said, Darlene, aren't you afraid that they're going to think, gosh, you know, there's so many minority kids, so many problems. They're not going to support your school system. You're really going to be in trouble. You know, I said, I have to share it. How else do I get the resources and support for it if I don't share what really is there? I'm not going to mask it. And it was a risk I took. But it paid off because when I went, the next thing, when you, for those of us that are educators, you pass a bond, it's a lot of work. Because in my community in Salt Lake, and I'm sure it's for years as well, most taxpayers in your community don't have children in schools. So why would they pay for an increase? But when I shared all that data and made it transparent, we passed our bond with over 70% approval. So they understood the need and they knew where it was going to go for. So you have to be honest about the data. So the last one, institutionalizing cultural knowledge, train, teach, and model new behaviors. The leader communicates effectively with all stakeholders. It's using, focused on inclusive decision making, collaboration, and truly making a difference in your structure, institutionalizing, so it's long term. So I have quite a few examples of that in Salt Lake, but it's close to the time. I'm not going to uh, spend all that, but I'm going to give you one example. We were able to receive an Annenberg grant to really reform uh, education in Salt Lake. And to do that, we began to analyze data deep. Before subgroups were even the norm, it was even before NCLB, so this was, we were ahead of our time. And we began to look at course pattern takings of students who were not successful. So we used a GPA, we used a SAT-9 test, we used all sorts of other uh, data that the schools had. And we began to look at students who were struggling, and we looked at their course patterns because your high school course schedule is gonna tell you a lot about what your system values. It just is, it's gonna tell you what it values. It's the, probably the best piece of data about what your community values and course taking. And I found many of the students that were underperforming were enrolled in one or two more classes at, as teacher assistants. Now, where they got the idea that this would help them perform higher or get better grades, I don't know. But we quickly had conversations about that at the high school. And some things I heard in the, in the room were, were pretty hurtful. Well, the parents don't care. That's what they want. OK. Uh, the kids want it because they want an easy class. And uh, they're not going to go to college anyway. So they'll probably just get the diploma or a completion. Don't worry about it. Or honestly, we don't know where to put them. We don't, we don't have the courses. We don't know what, what interventions to put. And that was an honest answer. And so we began to look at that and begin to make changes institutionally about how to make that happen. TAs, if teachers need TAs, it is a, it's a, probably a senior who's already got accepted to Harvard, has one class, and needs to put that student there, but not the students who are underperforming. We had to begin to look at that. And that's when we talk about institutionalizing based on information about your groups and, 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 and people that you know. So when you go across the, the, the standards of behavior, when you talk about cultural destructiveness, when you look at managing differences, cultural blindness really believe that I may facilitate consensus or bring multiple issues to, avoid, to a vote, but I really don't bring everybody in because they don't have a need to know. Or leaders who truly promote ideas and decisions and they're supported by the dominant majority culture as it was about the discipline procedures, but they don't talk about changing that. That's cultural blindness. And if you go to the left and you go to cultural destructiveness or cultural incapacity, that's where it, the harm is the greatest. The harm is still on cultural blindness, but to the degree that our schools act more like, and businesses and organizations, not, I'm not going to pick on schools, my profession, but how many organizations do you work in where you do not include people of diverse opinions or people who don't look like you, act like you, talk like you, or don't have that experience? 
because it's more comfortable to be with those that, that are like you. So it's a, it's a continuum of leadership, not just for school, but to really to value where are you in the organization and growing towards cultural proficiency. So if we truly value diversity, we must be the ones here in this room, because you chose to be at this session and not someone else, and so I'm going to take it at face value that you want to do it, to become culturally proficient. We need to be brave. We need to be strong. We need to have courage. But we need to be compassionate as well. We need to be diligent. We need to be transformational professionals who understand that inequity in schools is a microcosm of inequities in society. It requires a relentless commitment to this work. It's about educational justice while breaking down barriers to success for underserved st students. So I'm going to talk about changing the conversation as one example. Flipping the challenge, the e flipping the EL challenge. There was a survey just recently conducted, and my colleague just gave this to me. It was perfect timing. It's from the MetLife, Com uh, MetLife Teacher Survey. So they surveyed teachers across the country. And here are some findings. They found increased stress, these are principals and teachers, and a growing job discon discontentment among school site leaders and their teachers. The survey notes that many of the challenges facing schools these days are issues over which ed educators have no control. Among responsibilities that school leaders face, those that teachers and principal identify as most challenging result from conditions that origi originate beyond school doors. So this was a finding. Teachers and principals rate the responsibilities of addressing the individual needs of diverse learners and engaging parents and the community in proving the education of students as significant leadership challenges. Now, I didn't know that kids that look like me were a significant leadership challenge. I didn't know that communities that are under-resourced are significant challenges. I view them as opportunities. So how can we help them learn English? How can they help me learn to become a stronger leader for them? So let's ask ourselves how they can help us become more culturally proficient. How can we embrace all cultures, see our students with assets, not deficits, recognize their strength, talk to them about their stories. And when you hear their stories and what they've gone through, I know I couldn't survive. I don't know what would be scarier. I'm flying a plane, would be scary, but a young child, 14 or 15, from another country, not knowing English, and walking into one of our comprehensive high, school, comprehensive high schools, that's scary. And they do it every day, hoping to be embraced. So I want us to have the faces staring back at us in our classrooms, to be seen not as a challenge to overcome, but as a gift to be treasured. So my challenge to you, because I've got a timer now, I've got a few minutes left. My challenge and reward to you is to take this, this rubric that I gave you and assess your organization to determine the extent to which you solicit diverse points of view and opinions, specifically from groups whom you don't associate with on a regular basis. Look across the standard of behaviors where is your organization, your business? Second, have you had to make a decision for an underserved population? If not, why not? Why aren't you opening up the box and seeing what needs to be done? And if you were, were you criticized for the decision? If yes, how did you handle it? I think it's important to reflect because if you are in this journey of cultural proficiency and you really are going to be transformational in your work, you're going to have opportunities to fail again. You're going to have opportunities to confront these on a regular basis. So learning how to handle it and document it does help for the next time. And then third, look inside. Determine where you are on this continuum of behaviors and develop your action plan to move one column over. Because at the end, when you do this, and I'm asking you to do it within a month, you'll become empowered leaders and lifetime agents for equity and social justice who provoke a moral imperative for making the positive changes that will benefit our Latino students and others who need your voice to be their advocate. 
I was going to leave you with a quote. It's a long one, but I chose to leave you instead with a story that helped me in my journey. When I was deciding to leave Los Angeles to go to Utah, I was leaving, as I said, not knowing a single person in Utah. Didn't know anybody. Excited about it, but I was leaving my husband, my mother, my family, my close friends, my big support system, as all of us have. And I thought to myself, how am, oh my God, how am I going to do this? And then I remembered a conversation that I had with a parent. And it was just kind of something that came to me that I realized this is why I'm going. Her story was not unique for most immigrant families. She came to the United States for a better life for her children. Economics were down, she, you know, struggling. It was right after the war in El Salvador. And so I talked to her and I asked her, how did you do this? How did you get the courage to come across? She goes, well, it was okay till I got to Mexico. I said, what happened? She goes, it was just really difficult. And I paid the coyote and I did this. I said, so how did you do it? She goes, well, I didn't want to get caught. So what I did is every, at a bus stop, when the bus, because there would be buses taking them all the way to the, to the border of the United States, I would get under the bus and I'd get under the axle and I would hold on to it like this. And I would just ride it because I knew they would stop again. I said, how long did you hold on? She goes, probably about three hours. How did you do that? I said, I, 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 I was just so in awe and shocked. And she goes, well, I, because of that, she goes, I did it because of my children. I did it because I wanted a place better for them. I said, and when you got here, she goes, I didn't know a soul. But there's a community here, people from El Salvador. So I went and I looked and I, and I found people. And then I eventually, you know, she had been here already about four years and I eventually brought my family. And looking inside, I felt like such a little kid. I felt this big when I remembered her story. Because why was I afraid? I was gonna go to Utah, first of all. They weren't gonna kick me out, they invited me to come. I was gonna be pulled over for my papers. They invited me. I spoke the language. I had a profession. And that woman gave me the courage to do something to step out of my own comfort zone. So what I ask you to do is when you're working with diverse groups, to look at their humanity, look at their courage, their generosity, but more important, what you can learn from them. Because they have a lot to give, and we still have a lot to learn. Thank you for your time this day, and have a great day. Thank you. Do I have time for questions? I have a couple of minutes for a question, so if you have a question, uh, you can go to the mics, and we just have a few minutes. I talk longer than I thought I was. Uh, thank, you. thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Luke Miskevich. I have two girls who go to a great uh, elementary school here in East Austin, uh, Mets Elementary. Um, overwhelmingly Latino, overwhelmingly um, English language learners, overwhelmingly under-resourced. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess my, you know, so I, I, I work, we're the minority there, and I try and be an involved parent, and I work with a diverse community every day, but I think to be real honest about it, as a white male, sometimes I struggle on how best to help with the expertise I have and also empower mm -hmm. these parents and these students. And then some days I think I just need to sit down and get out of the way. Um, and sometimes you might have to, yeah. and that's okay. Okay. <laughs> but you also want to engage and let them know, have them get to know you and get to know you. But um, your, your openness and willing to do that is already a big step. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tony Aguilar. I'm from West Texas. I'm a CEO of a company called Campus Slice. We help students raise money for tuition. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, um, it's great that we're going to see our organizations take this step and open um, our businesses and, and, mm -hmm. and our individual schools to, to these changes here. But how do you see this playing a role as far as teaching these things uh, for teachers going through the certification process mm -hmm. so they know how to deal with this? Or teaching this um, like at, at school so every teacher can 
know how to like implement these changes. I see like doing it one by one is not going to get it done. Yeah, yeah. There's there's 50,000 schools in our country, so that's going to be a uh, you know uh, a lot of work. I can tell you that more universities are doing it, adding cultural proficiency as a way of their curriculum. And I'm going to brag about my system right now. And I want to thank my colleague Maria Ott, who's I don't know where she went, but she's some here. Um, I left I left being a superintendent. I was a superintendent for over 20 years because I was offered this great opportunity to create a new master's program online uh, for school leaders. So in developing, and my passion for this, in developing the, the course content, which I had the responsibility and, and, the, re, um, and the mandate to do that, I've infused the cultural proficiency framework through every course so that the leaders then can start to begin to frame that conversation as a leader, as a principal, so that maybe in a few years, the leaders, as I survey, will not see it as a challenge, but a wonderful opportunity. And so what happens in most universities is they are they're stretched with the requirement uh, to get their certification. So it's going to be a slow process. But I thought if I have an opportunity for school leaders that value that and support it, it's one way. But it's something that I think in your own work you can talk to universities about because it's, if not, it's not, it's, we're not gonna, it's going to move very slow. And I think the urgency is there given what, what we're facing in our country. Hi, so. Dr. Robles. I'm Caroline Sweet. I'm an educator here in Austin. And um, I very much like the tool you passed out uh, with the rubric about assessing cultural competency. But I feel like many of my colleagues might assess themselves incorrectly mm -hmm. and think they're more competent oh. than they are. I'm more beautiful and thinner than I really <laughs> am. So, you know, I understand that. So how do you approach the conversation of actually you're pretty blind or incompetent um, and not on the correct end of the spectrum. Yeah, what, what we start with in, in the work that Dr. Lindsay and Dr. Uh, Graham do, we start with an organization. We start with an organization because that's a, an entity out there. It's very, it's, it, it's a lot of, it's, I, mean, I failed to say it, but this is, this is hard work. I'm still not proficient. I'm still culturally, I'm, I, I'm still on this journey. It, you're never there. It's a way of life, as I said, it's a way of life. But you begin with an organization. And you put, you know, little stickers on. There's, they, they do some great work. If you Google Dr. Lindsay and Dr. Graham or even us, we're building a tool. We're creating right now. We don't have it yet. Our, um, a manual for leaders on our rubric about how to do that. How do you engage in the conversations? But I would start first with where the organization is, because as we all know, I can tell you what you need, uh, but I can't tell you what I need. So it's 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 sometimes a safe way to start. Yes. Hi, my name is Catherine Torres. I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington, and I'm currently um, in a school where the Latino pop population has slowly grown, but the staff is still predominantly white. And so they're trying to do some of this work, and I'm noticing certain things. And so what sort of advice would you give someone who's currently still seen as an outsider to that organization, um, uh, you know, observing, and then hopefully, you know, once my dissertation data collection is done, I can begin to have a conversation with them. So what sorts of questions I, do you think I should? Uh, I don't know if it's, a, if it's questions as much as the conversation around how best do we serve our students? How, what, what are some ways that we do? Because if you always talk about the barriers, about, like I said in the survey, about you know, what can't be done, I always say, well, what can we do? What can we start making small steps to change what we're doing to serve more students? Because I, it takes time. As I said, I was a six-year journey in Salt Lake, and, and we still were getting there. But I knew that I had made progress, as one story, with, with the schools. When they began to reorganize their own budgets to create the programs that needed, it wasn't a challenge anymore. The challenge was more about how urgent it needed to get done, because time was of the essence. But one story that I love to share is when I was sitting with my, because we focus a lot on EL. Remember, uh, we made tough decisions about where the resources were going to go. So yes, I took money from schools to focus on certain things, and I got hit hard. You know, this it should go to equal. You know, one dollar, one dollar, when the needs were ten to one. But when my board understood what we were doing, and they and the staff and everyone, because data was important. You know, the accountability piece. That one day we're giving a report on English learners, and the report came back so, ugh, where our EL kids in third and fifth grade were scoring equal to the English only. I mean, that took time. It wasn't overnight. And finally, my board member whispers to me and says, you know, Darlene, if all our EL skills students do better, 
all our scores go up. You got it. You got it. So it takes time to have that conversation because it's about being served, because they want to be successful. Everybody in my school district wanted to be successful, but when you don't have the tools or have the time for the conversation, you get you blame you know, somebody else. So I was fortunate in the system where I had a terrific board of education, I had the resources, and we took the time during the years, you know, six days a year for six years to move this forward. So good luck to you. I'm timed out now. Thank you. And again, we're selling our book if you want to see it. My colleagues are here. Can you stand, Carmela and Maria, so they know who you are? Thank you for being here with me.